Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We are about to get started with our next panel, which will take a deep dive into opinion journalism. But before we do, I wanna share just a quick few notes with you all. First, I wanna give a big thanks to the Knight Foundation and Google News Initiative for sponsoring this year's ISOJ. I also wanna make sure everyone knows that all ISOJ sessions, including this panel, are being simultaneously interpreted uh, into Spanish, thanks to support from Univision Noticias. So if you're tuning in via Zoom, you can click on the interpretation globe in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, select the Spanish channel, and then tune into the Spanish interpretation. If you run into any technical difficulties with Zoom, you can always tune in via YouTube uh, in English and in Spanish, and we'll post the links to those YouTube pages in the chat so you can easily access them. So we're now going to turn our attention to our next panel titled, It's Not the Old Op-Ed Page Anymore, The Growth of Opinion in Online Journalism, featuring four journalists who are at the forefront of opinion news and journalism. The conversation will be led by Katie Kingsbury, opinion editor of the New York Times, as some of you may have seen, uh, Katie wrote a piece this week announcing that the New York Times is actually retiring the term op-ed because it's a relic of an older age and an older print newspaper design. So I'm mentioning this, one, because it's interesting, but also because at times during today's panel, you'll hear the speakers refer to the New York Times as op-eds, and that's because this panel was pre-recorded. So uh, just so you know, the speakers will be live after the pre-recording uh, during the Q&A portion. So you're more than welcome to pose your questions to them and they'll do their best to answer as many as they can. So now without further ado, I would like to hand the conversation over to Katie. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Katie Kingsbury and I head up the New York Times Opinion Operation. Thank you so much for being here. I was honored to be asked by ISOJ to moderate a conversation between this impressive group of opinion journalism. But first, Sewell, Karen, Matt, and I have pre-recorded some thoughts on where we see opinion journalism headed online. Then we'll open it up to your questions live. First, we have Sewell, the editorial page editor at the Los Angeles Times. Hi, Katie. Hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be back at ISOJ, um, which I haven't attended, I'm afraid, in about a, a decade, but I'm glad to be back here again, um, thanks to the hospitality of Rosenthal and others at um, the School of Journalism at UT Austin. I've been reflecting a lot on the title. Uh, it's not the old op-ed page anymore. I'd begin by saying that, um, you know, history has a weird way of moving in cycles and repeating itself. When I think about the origins of the op-ed page in the early 1970s, um, and as everyone knows, the modern op-ed page really you know, goes back to the New York Times in 1970, uh, and I had the privilege of working at the New York Times op-ed page for almost five years. It was a time in the early 70s that's not dissimilar to that today, a time of very, very strong ideologies, um, a lot of ferment on both the left and the right, um, the threat of political violence was very, very real, perhaps even more real than it is today. Um, and also, um, you know, really a sense that a broader um, array of voices need to be heard. So I think there are actually some great similarities between what's going on now and what's going on 50, what went on 50 years ago. That said, there are also profound differences. I think the whole hyperpolarization in America over the last 30, 40 years has in fact gotten profoundly worse trust in institutions has really eroded. Um, you know, when the New York Times debuted its op-ed page in 1970, there were still a very wide, broad swath of Americans who trusted the New York Times, regardless of their own political beliefs or views. Unfortunately, we're now at a time when a lot of people see, appear to be choosing or consuming uh, news sources that uh, confirm or affirm their pre-existing ideolo ideology or disposition. And I think that's something very, very uh, troubling. Um, and it gets into the notion of filter bubbles, and it also gets into the notion of what it means to speak to a broad public. And that's a big, big, big difference from the early 70s. Um, I wanna just talk a little bit about four trends that I see in op-ed journalism. Well, the first relates to what I just talked about, the, the increasing ideological polarization of our times, 
which I think sometimes might be better, more more reflected in elites than among than among everyone else. But it's been, of course, exacerbated. Um, in 1970, we didn't have 24 cable news, much less 24 uh, hour uh, commentary on cable. We certainly didn't have the quick takes that uh, the Twitter offers, um, and we didn't have the kind of rapid response opinion journalism uh, uh, that we have today. So I think one of the things that opinion journalism has to do is help in some ways to rebuild trust in a public square. And by that, mean, I mean really the ability to focus in all our, um, in everything we publish on good faith arguments. So really taking kind of the traditional precepts around persuasion, rhetoric, use of evidence, use of logic, the ability to anticipate and um, kind of pre-butt countervailing arguments, and a general um, uh, tone of civility that we would like to see modeled in our society as a whole. I think our op-ed pages have to do that. Um, it is tempting, and perhaps it is easy. It would be easy to kind of reflect the most, publish only the most extreme views, because frankly, those are often the ones that you know the internet rewards. But I think it's very important that we avoid that. And that doesn't mean um, a kind of false equivalency. I think we're being called upon as journalists to really document some of the major trends of our time and not be naive, um, not think that you know the political parties are exactly equal when it comes to how much they care about voting rights, for example, or that um, the debate over climate change is really a debate over its you know reality versus what to do about it. I mean, I think that age of false equivalency, of course, uh, has come to an end not too soon. The second dimension I mentioned about op-ed pages is an increasing orientation, especially among regional publications like the LA Times, toward an ethos of community and service. And by that I mean um, the threat to local news in America has been really profound. I think everyone here is aware that something like half of newspaper journalism jobs in America have vanished since the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009. And that has meant the emergence of so-called news deserts around the United States and that has also meant an erosion of trust at the local level. So here at the LA Times, I'm really focused on trying to um, promote and publish the broadest array of California perspectives um, as possible. Knowing that, you know, national, nationally known or federal, federally known politicians and, and characters and commentators will already be amply reflected, frankly, in the pages of national publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. What can we do to try to restore trust and community at the local and state level is an issue that interests me a great deal. The third issue I wanna discuss, um, something dear to my heart, which is the role of op-ed pages in kind of participating in the historical reckoning that we're going through right now over America's painful past with racism in particular. Um, I had the great privilege of being the lead author last year of, uh, of an editorial, the lead editorial with the project, with a project that we called Our Reckoning with Racism, which attempted through a large editorial that I wrote and then, um, uh, and then some, some, some personal reflections by journalists, we really attempted to reckon with the Los Angeles Times' very fraught complicity with white supremacy and its history of institutional racism, really going back to the 1880s. Um, and it was a project that, you know, we got a lot of internal support for, but more importantly to me, the response from readers was really tremendous. And I think a lot of people really respected that we had the courage and the introspection to be able to really look at our painful past and apologize for it. And to assert that, you know, we're not just expecting people to accept our apology on its face. We will be judged by how well we do in the future in terms of diversity, inclusion, equity. Better, re better covering the, the, the diverse communities of the nation's most populous uh, state and the nation's most populous county, which of course is LA County. Um, the fourth uh, and final thing I'll mention is that I think op-ed pages have become more interesting in part because uh, at least at our page, we are trying to move away from the traditional reliance on elected officials and policy experts. Um, there's still room for professors and scholars. They're, they're a big part of what we publish still. But we're also increasingly searching for the real voices of people's authentic lived experiences, which is oftentimes as important a form of authority as, as kind of you know, traditional research scholarship. I'm very proud of the voices from the pandemic that we have published periodically over the past year in which we have sought 
the perspectives of essential workers, healthcare workers, uh, immigrant advocates, um, people really kind of on the front lines of this pandemic. And of course, it sometimes takes help uh, from a seasoned editor in getting uh, these folks to write, you know, polished prose. Understandably, they're not professional writers for a living. They they are doing, they're engaged in other uh, vital tasks. But, you know, reaching out to folks whose voices might not traditionally be heard is one of the most important things an op-ed page can do today. Um, and with that, I'm ready to close and I look forward to our question session. Thank you, Sewell. Next, we'll have Karen Atia from the Washington Post. Hi, Katie. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And um, uh, this is actually my first time um, at ISOJ. So again, thank you all for having me here. Um, Sewell uh, brought up so many, um, so many great points, some of which I will, I will touch on and some of which I hope to, to expand a little bit more. Um, so for the to sort of understand you know, where I'm coming at uh, this discussion from, uh, I am the uh, global opinions editor and uh, a writer for the Washington Post opinion section. Um, and I've spent my entire career at the Washington Post, which has been almost seven years, in the opinion section. Um, and before that uh, was uh, a reporter uh, for uh, AP and various other outlets um, abroad. So, with that, um, my experience uh, has been, I would say, uh, trying to bring very much a, a global perspective and also um, uh, trying to uh, cultivate and court and appeal to international audiences. Um, and so with Global Opinions, which um, I helped to start in, in 2016, uh, the idea was we wanted to reach, uh, you know, English-speaking audiences in, in countries like uh, India, countries in Europe, um, Africa, and with that, I think a large part of what uh, we aimed to do and and still do was really, again, like you mentioned earlier, really understanding the power of voice and the power of authenticity. Um, I think, to a certain extent, when it came to understanding the world in in journalism and in, in academic circles i think there was a a push on hopefully my part to push back in in some ways or against what i think i would call a little bit of the interpreter class particularly in washington where you have a uh, foreign correspondents uh, uh you have uh think tankers tasked very often to explain foreign countries for us. I think in many ways, uh, Global Opinions was an attempt to disrupt that and say, why don't we just let people from the countries, from these cultures, speak for themselves about what's going on in their countries, to speak to their audiences, as well as to speak to um, American audiences as well. So that has been a really, eye-opening in terms of not only just understanding that the digital marketplace is a global marketplace, but also understanding that um, in, in many ways, the uh, uh, how we have tried to cultivate a broad spectrum of, of voices and opinions and backgrounds, uh, we often find ourselves, you know, in the global opinion section saying many of these practices we can adopt for broadening, expanding um, how we cover America as well. Uh, one thing, you know, I would say as, as being a part of the, the post um, and being a, an American newspaper, uh, trying to uh, be a home for international writers, um, we often are getting writers who have not had opportunities um, or, or voice in their countries. Um, we've had uh, opportunities to, to basically, in, in some ways, be a refuge sometimes for human rights writers, activists who have been barred from being able to speak and write freely in their country. Um, and as you know, many people may know, so the most uh, tragically um, well known case of that was uh, our work, my work with Jamal Khashoggi, uh, the Saudi journalist who was murdered in uh, in Istanbul in, in 2018. So I think 
where I've been seeing how we've we've approached um, international uh, opinions, global opinions, is really again um, being very proactive about looking for those voices who don't get a voice or a platform in their countries, whether it's due to authoritarian governments, uh, whether it's due to, I'm thinking of, um, you know, Rokaya Diallo, a, a black female writer uh, from France, uh, who has, you know, written great and provocative pieces specifically about racism in France. And um, have we've seen how she often faces incredible pushback uh, in, in France. So I think that that has been, um, really eye-opening and, and just recognizing that the, the field of uh, the marketplace of ideas is a global marketplace of ideas. And we've seen that both in governments uh, responding to pieces in the post and, you know, unfortunately, um, governments attempting to, to silence those who, who would work for the post. Um, so I wanted to bring that kind of broader global perspective back to, um, I guess broadly, like where I see things going and perhaps what I wish I would could see more of in, in uh, opinions journalism. I think I see op-ed pages um, and in general how we're following what's happening broadly in our culture, in our world now, which is this reckoning, which is the power of those, again, who have not been given platforms, who, you know, frankly, have been unheard, unseen, or even erased um, from the media and from discourse, who now through uh, the internet, through social media, now have avenues to be able to um, express themselves, to challenge, to critique, and to push back. And I think that is a, a good thing. Um, and I think that this is something that is making a lot of institutions extraordinarily um, uncomfortable. But it means that change is happening and those who have not traditionally been a part of mainstream discourse are now uh, finding their way in. Um, and so I think with, with that um, is where opinions journalism is finding itself in a bit of a quandary or, or difficult questions to have to to ask and to answer as Sewell mentioned you know before the genesis of the opinion page was with the New York Times and I think so we have to be honest when we're reckoning about the history of even the opinion page that it, it is a business product it is a, there is journalism and then there's journalism as a business product that we are selling to consumers and to readers, consumers. And I think where, where the discomfort, where the push and pull, where, where the, the anger in many ways is coming from is that, you know, we so often tell ourselves, you know, we are the, uh, we are in the business of being in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, we are just here to provide a platform for this marketplace. And I think what the reckonings, particularly of the last year, have shown us is that there are increasingly there are demands for not uh, for understanding that like in this marketplace of ideas, first of all, particularly in this country. Uh, ideas that have caused harm, racist ideas, sexist ideas, anti-LGBT ideas have been a part of that marketplace, that there is an audience for that. Um, and so I think where we struggle is that, uh, you know, is people pushing for journalism to move more towards harm reduction um, to those who have been marginalized, who haven't been heard, to those who are asking for different language versus the, the pull to try to appeal to as many people in that marketplace of ideas as possible. Um, so I think that this, I don't know exactly 
how it's going to shake out. I think we're already seeing um, in, in major newspapers, um, ours as well, where even we are changing how we, uh, we refer to various groups of people. We are changing our language. There are questions, you know, even as we're speaking right now in the, um, you know, police shootings of, of black, uh, black men um, and the reckonings over that, there are um, pushes, you know, from the outside to, to change how we even think about, talk about, you know, taking the police, police version of things. So I think that um, this, we've got to hear both sides, you know, as, as a business strategy, uh, in many ways, as a journalism business strategy, audiences are starting to call for uh, difference. Um, and I think that this is, is this push and pull is going to continue is going to continue happening particularly as frankly our pages in many ways are still facing competition from whether it's you know right right wing media uh individual facebook accounts um social media accounts some other alternative uh forms of of, of voices and viewpoints um i think our our challenge is to add value and in many ways, the way that we try to add value to the conversation, I think, is to have, um, you know, fact-checking <laughs> basis, editing, and um, and I think that's where and, and inclusion. And I think we're realizing that inclusion of various voices um, is not only just a luxury, but it is an imperative. But if we are going to remain, uh, remain relevant and remain, you know, um, um, adding value, we have to uh, continue to to uphold, you know, these, these standards. And with that, um, I think I'll close. And again, thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, just so much we get to talk about in the Q&A. And you raised so many interesting points. Um, and next we have slow, boring writer Matt Iglesias. Hi, um, I'm really glad to be here. Hope to maybe someday uh, come in person uh, to ISOJ. It's a great event. It's it's really my pleasure to be with this uh, this great panel of of really distinguished people. Um, you know, something I I think about all the time these days is a quote uh, from from Jim Barksdale, who was a businessman for a long time. He was at um, AT and T Wireless. He was at FedEx. He was one of the founders of, of Netscape. And he said, "There's only two ways to make money in business." One is to bundle and the other is to unbundle. Um, you know, and it's it, it's a joke, uh, but I think it's very important to journalism and how things are changing because there, there's bundling and there's unbundling and they happen and they come together for different kinds of reasons and at different levels uh, in the stack as technology changes. Um, my mother was uh, a journalist of, of sorts. Um, she worked in magazines, but she worked in the graphic design side of things. And she did it in the analog era. And that always left me with a sort of profound sense of the print journalism product as a kind of a physical manufactured commodity, right? She had a, a little box that was full of exacto knives and she had all this rubber cement and these T squares. And, you know, she would, she would make a magazine right, uh, as a manufactured good, in fact. Um, and so the scale of a traditional periodical was driven by facts about manufacturing and distribution of physical products, right? Once you had a printing press and you were going to run it every day and you had a fleet of trucks and was going to drive around to everybody in the metro area, it made a lot of sense to put up just a lot of stuff in the bundle, right? And that is is the newspaper. It's like a all the stuff you can think of um, coming in there. And the op-ed page, you know, as Sewell was saying in its origin, was very much the idea that the newspaper had to become even more expansive, that you would have the opinions of the editorial board, but then you also needed these other opinions. And they had to all be inside your one newspaper because you wanted to encompass all points of view while still giving people a, a viewpoint, right, on the op-ed page. 
And, you know, that's an idea that even as it's upheld in some ways by, by modern institutions, doesn't reflect how people consume uh, content on, on the internet, right? Um, you can just read some articles from one place and some from someplace else. You can surf around. You don't need any one website to sort of be your whole life and be everything that there is for you. And so, you know, what I am doing on Substack and a lot of other writers there is essentially unbundling, right? And what you get as an unbundled self is you get um, much more brand clarity uh, than you sort of can as a columnist at a bigger institution. You write solely under your own name for an audience that follows you, and you are not sort of... Um, responsible for a larger institutional mission or institutional brand or institutional perception. It also means that I have a business that is not built on the kind of um, algorithmic platform internet of Facebook and, and Google. And of course, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, these are all subscription businesses at this point. Uh, but precisely because they are large institutions with lots and lots of other people working at them, there's still a meaningful distinction between which stories get more traffic and which get less. Uh, you know, I know when I've written for these these other places, uh, you know, they're, they're counting that. They're sort of wanting to see what goes viral that counts for something. In the one-person subscription marketplace, that's not really true. And you're not finding yourself programming for Google or programming for Facebook. You're programming for your own group of readers. Uh, what you trade off for that is, of course, a much smaller um, reach. I mean, I feel very privileged by the number of subscribers that I've had. It's been more successful, frankly, than I anticipated uh, when, when I started almost six months ago, but it's still not nearly as many people um, as, as I can reach, you know, if I write an op-ed somewhere or as I used to when, when I worked at Vox on, on a typical story. Uh, so, you know, that's a big sort of downside, I think, to solo publications and small kinds of things. To me, it's something that's offset by there's been this huge parallel increase in social media, uh, which I think is very important when we think about opinion journalism. The fact that there are so many people sort of giving their takes all day, every day on Twitter uh, matters a lot. And some of us who are on there you know, I think we, you would consider us opinion journalists, but lots of the people doing that are, you know, they're celebrities, they're athletes, they're academics, they work in think tanks, they work in advocacy organizations. You have politicians out there, but it's in this incredible, uh, blob of opinion, uh, some of it very well informed, some of it very interesting, some of it kind of terrible, uh, but it's out there all the time. And so, you know, our question as people who are trying to be professionals and trying to build businesses that are grounded in opinion is how do you differentiate yourself from this kind of maw of, of opinions that are constantly being voiced out there on social. Um, and, you know, I think you hear us all who are on this panel talking about different ways to do that and different ways to rethink what the sort of meaning of, of the bundle for the modern world is. Sewell's talking about trying to make the LA Times a more distinctively California uh, set of voices because that's a, lots of people live in California. Um, they need uh, news, they need media, they need opinion. That's something that the LA Times can do that probably nobody else can do. Uh, Karen's talking about, you know, bringing in voices from around the world, the kinds of voices who are very interesting to Americans, but who I think even very eager, even very curious Americans might not know who those voices are or where to find them. So that's a kind of service that the Washington Post can provide. I think the kind of writing that I do is in some ways more traditional than either of those ideas. Uh, having columnists who, you know, live in Washington and write about politics and, you know, say senators do this or that, it's actually incredibly old fashioned. And it's so old fashioned that I think in some ways it may not make as much sense in the modern version of what digital newspapers are. And it's why I think the unbundling 
makes sense for me, makes sense for some other people who are in my kind of, uh, of situation, that it's an old fashioned kind of work that needs a new kind of business model. And it's the older institutions that are actually embracing newer visions of what kinds of voices they want and, and why. And it's just, it's sort of a fascinating, exciting time. I mean, I know obviously, um, the intensified competition, uh, both for advertisers from sort of digital companies and also just uh, media organization against media organization has been traumatic, I think, to the businesses of so many journalists and of so much local journalism. It's been a, a scary time to be someone who cares about journalism. But it's also a very exciting moment, I think, particularly in the world of opinion, where we're really realigning and rethinking, uh, you know, what are big institutional opinion forums for, right? Who are they for? What's out there? Uh, given that people who are more established and sort of maybe people like me who've had a more traditional access to the public forum can find new spaces for ourselves. Older spaces can be filled with new voices. And I think it's a very sort of intriguing uh, back and forth, uh, I don't know, different metaphors, tug of war, yin and yang. Um, but I, I think it's a very exciting and interesting time for kind of older voices to find new platforms, older platforms to find find new voices. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, you know, hearing what everyone has to say about that. Thank you so much, Matt. All right. Um, I think I am up now. Um, again, I'm Katie Kingsbury, and I run the opinion report at the New York Times. Last year, my team embarked on a process to better understand how our readers find and consume opinion journalism. The good news? They told us loudly and clearly how much they value and appreciate reading intelligent arguments. They told us they very much want to be challenged and discover unexpected viewpoints in our report. And it turns out they still seem to like our bundle. Meeting that curiosity was one of the reasons the Times invented the first modern op-ed page 50 years ago, as everyone um, on this panel has mentioned. J.B. Oakes, one of my predecessors, was the driving force behind its initiation. Here's how he explained the need for it. Diversity of opinion is the lifeblood of democracy. The minute we begin to insist that everyone think the same way we think, our democratic way of life is in danger. So from the beginning, democracy has been at the heart of what we do at New York Times Opinion. But as so many of my fellow panelists have noted, that legacy also puts an enormous pressure on us to be constantly reassessing what the modern opinion report can and should be. And it's really exciting. Today, my team includes about 140, really 150 staff journalists, and we do our work in 18 cities across four continents and in dozens of time zones. So how do we work? Yes, we still produce our daily print pages and the Sunday Review. Here you can see some recent covers that our editors, art directors, and designers have put together. And we are, already, we are always proud when we can produce signature text pieces. It was an incredible honor back in July that as his life was coming to an end, Congressman John Lewis asked us to publish his final thoughts on the day of his funeral. With the utmost care and respect, we, repa we prepared his words for publication. I know I felt that day, the full, impressive, and validating weight of my job. I do feel like I have one of the greatest jobs there is. It is an absolute honor to publish a civil rights hero like John Lewis, and I am equally honored to produce an enterprise project like the one we undertook on the Amazon last year. That's the rainforest. We spent eight months pulling together this package featuring more than a dozen experts on and from the Amazon region to tell us what's going on there today and to better help imagine a better future. And then we paired those voices with poetry, photography, beautiful, beautiful design, and this extraordinary graphic that charts unparalleled the unparalleled environmental devastation and how it affects so many other parts of the world. We then translated the entire package from English into Spanish and Portuguese to make sure we could make it accessible to as many readers as possible. Much of the prowess we've built with big enterprises pieces like the Amazon package, we then poured back into graphics design and reported investigative commentary in our daily report. Stuart Thompson, our graphics director, leads a significant portion of that work. 
In December, Stuart produced an easy to use interactive to explain when most Americans could expect to be vaccinated based on the available information then. Over 10 million people typed in their data, and I suspect many of them, many of us, are glad it turned off. He was off by several months. Then in January, Stuart spent weeks listening to QAnon and Trump supporters online and interspersed audio clips and texts to offer a rare glimpse into their world for the Times audience. Speaking of audio, over the past year, we dramatically increased our investment into being at the cutting edge of what opinion audio can be, including the launch of two major shows, Sway with Kara Swisher and The Ezra Klein Show, and a relaunch of our first podcast, The Argument, with Jane Coaston as its host. On The Argument every week, people who disagree with one another come together on the podcast to hash it out. Here's a clip of Jane interviewing Kevin Nadal on hate crime legislation following the shootings in Atlanta last month. Broader acknowledge and acceptance of hate crimes legislation and acceptance writ large, as you mentioned, by civil society groups and attorneys general, that seems like a net positive. But Kevin, you, you have a look of skepticism in this very visual medium. What makes you skeptical about hate crimes legislation as a tool for combating bias crimes? Our work in audio in many ways builds on our award-winning opinion video operation. This month, for example, we've had our fingers crossed waiting on, waiting on pins and needles to hear whether our opdoc film, Concerto as a Conversation, wins an Oscar. We've also seen some of our biggest impact, though, in the area of women and sports. In 2019, athletes like Alicia Montano and Alex Fel Allison Felix told their stories through opinion video of losing pay and sponsorship and health benefits after becoming pregnant. Within days, every major apparel company and the US Olympic Committee responded, changing their policies. Led by senior editor Lindsey Krauss, this important work, its impact and reach offered us other opportunities, including working with Megan Thee Stallion to produce this video on her experience as a black woman in the world. What does it mean to be a woman of color? She's got to be strong because that's just the expectation. Loving herself, but not too much because then she's conceited. Being his lady in the streets, but his freak in the sheets. Inheriting her grandma's love, but always loving the wrong one. Talking for her man, but not with her friends being constantly told she's too much or not enough. The most disrespected person is the black woman. Constantly having to prove she's a victim because society sides with a man. All of this work in different mediums and on different platforms is in pursuit of meeting our audiences where they are and hopefully building new relationships in the meantime. We're also constantly refining our strategies around social media, newsletters, comments, and on-site programming. One of the most popular features we started since the pandemic are regular chats and interviews with our columnists and writers on Twitter and Instagram. But we know that journalism doesn't travel the world in the clean packages like the editorial and op-ed page of your. Remember those readers we've been speaking with this past year? Another thing they told us is they crave more differentiation, clarity, and context. In particular, they want to understand what, better when and why we're publishing outside writers, people who don't work for the Times, but bring direct ex expertise, personal experience, and authority to an issue. We really, re to this end, we recently launched two design efforts to help. We now add longer bios to pieces to give readers more context around the authors of any given piece, to illustrate their expertise on the subject they are writing about. And we've worked on what we internally call storyline modules that show up on the page while you're reading and direct you more clearly to the curated assortment of pieces we've published on any given topic. After talking to readers, we knew we could provide more clarity through more intentional design. And there's more to come. In the mid 20th century, J.B. Oaks saw the future of opinion journalism and the New York Times set its path for the next 50 years. I'm so excited to have my team be at the forefront of where it is headed next. Although somehow, I doubt Oaks would have ever predicted Weird Al Yankovic would be part of that legacy. So to finish, Here's Weird Al, the New York Times opinion section. Ah, we're all doomed! 
<laughs> People are breathing out this living poison and trying to float into my orifices. And I lost my car keys. I, I had to steal my neighbor's segue to get here today. And on the way, I crashed in this dumpster. And these kids are making a video on now I'm on TikTok. I can't. Excuse me. Yeah. Being not hysterical, despite, you know, things. Oh, I can do that. Dignified. <laughs> I can't help but laugh every time I see that video. I hope you did too. And as I said at the top, now we'll have a live moderated discussion. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Hi, everybody. We are now here uh, to have a discussion with Sewell and Karen and Matt, who I can't see on my screen right now, but I'm hoping to pop up soon. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you again for taking this time today to talk to me a little bit more about opinion journalism. Um, I actually wanted to start with a question from one of our um, viewers today, um, just because I thought it was a pretty smart one, which is from Juan Carlos from Madrid. He asked, um, he was addressing this question to Matt, but I actually would love to hear everybody's opinion on it. Um, in a world where everyone has an opinion, what is the difference in the quality of opinion articles from the media versus opinions from social networks? Is there disorder and chaos? And maybe Matt, you want to kick us off and and how you see that? Yeah, I mean, you know, on one level, I think social networks have been great for bringing a wide range of opinions uh, to the fore. We hear from more people in all walks of life. It's also been a great opportunity for people in academia, places like that, to sort of share their expertise in a way that's a little bit lower lift, I think, than doing formal opinion writing. Uh, so th there's incredible value to that kind of thing. At the same time, you know, I mean, if you work with editors and do something as your full-time job, uh, there is an opportunity to both, you know, do reporting that focuses specifically on the question you're trying to answer, and also to work on, frankly, just the quality of your expression, right? To create something that is good to read, it's really clearly written, um, things like that. I mean, I think that's what, what editors are doing all the time. I think it's what professional writers are doing, right? We're trying to create not just like, quote unquote, good opinions, or even have some kind of factual knowledge, but actual written works that are valuable and useful to people and clear and fun and engaging and things like that. And some people are great at doing that on an amateur basis, but like it's it's hard. And I think that's the real value of professionalism. Karen or Sul, do you guys have anything to, to add there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, understanding. It's, it's, it is about opinion, but writing itself is a craft. And I think what um, institutions who, who have staffs of uh, editors uh, try to do is to try to, um, I think in general, we, we like to think we're trying to elevate the craft so that we can elevate the quality of the national and international um, discussions that we're having about, about issues. Um, and yeah, so again, I, I think that's where, that's where the, sort of the, the craft of the journalism is attached to the pin because yes, uh, you know, everyone has opinions, but it's also about um, expressing it in a way, bolstering it in a way, editors, you know, challenging it in a way for it to be expressed in the best way possible to as many people as, as possible. So basically I agree with I agree with Matt, and another plus one for editors. <laughs> we all need editors. I, I definitely see the opinion pages sort of as a digital extension of what used to be the public sphere, which I think is very, you know, very much under threat. I mean, let's face it, our discourse are, is, is pretty coarse, pretty degraded, uh, uh, pretty, pretty degrading sometimes. And, you know, if you just want to hear noise, uh, um, cable news and, and Twitter uh, are really good at producing noise. I think ideas journalism at its best can really be about um, synthesizing and really kind of 
presenting ideas. You know, my, my favorite experience as an op-ed editor has been when, when a reader tells me, you know, I didn't think about it that way before. Aha, uh -huh, you're, make, you're making me see things in a new way. Because it's not even so much that the facts are revelatory. That's nice to have, but our job isn't the news pages, right? We by and large don't conduct original investigations. Rather, we're trying to take the, the, the complexity of the world and kind of um, putting an interpretive frame on it. And the best columnists, you know, give a very consistent interpretive frame and are really, really fun to read. Um, I used to say when I was at the New York Times working with the columnists, the columnists are like your old friends. You know, they might, well, they might not say something that shocks you, but you really want their take on it because they, you know, you're familiar with them and you always think they're a thoughtful person whom you want to hear from. And, you know, the challenge right now, of course, as the questioner um, gets at is, you know, what's the role of the institution? What's the role of the editors? Um, well, I hope we'll have more time to talk about this, but I think the Substack model and the idea of uh, the talent or the creators, the thinkers, the columnists going straight to uh, the reader, readers without any intermediation, you know, no one like uh, Katie or Karen or me is a very, very interesting notion. And we'll see how, how scalable that is. Yeah, I mean, all of you in your talk touched upon this idea of whether or not a news organization should present readers with a wide range of ideas and viewpoints, including those that they may or may not disagree with. Um, that is core to what we do in Times Opinion every day. And, and I'd argue it's pretty core to um, the democratic discourse in the United States and, and far afield from there. Um, Karen, I was especially interested in your mention of this concept of harm reduction. Um, and I'd love to hear from all of you um, a little bit more about how you see that mission evolving and how the news cycles that we've all lived through over the past few years has changed your thinking on it. So you wanna jump in first? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, me first, or Karen, whoever <laughs> whoever wants. Let's go. <laughs> um, Karen, go ahead. Yeah, um, I've pre-recorded, thought about this uh, a bit more, um, and thought about the uh, the reckoning, if you want to call it, with um, past and present harm that the media has done to particular communities, and I think there is this. We are having, you know, these these discussions about language, about language that is more inclusive, about uh, language that is more specific um, to to communities that have been um, harmed in some ways by being lumped in together as as monoliths. So I think there is like this that the uh, op-ed pages, just as our language in in general in society is is changing about harm reduction, about identity. This is where there's opportunities for, you know, as the LA Times has done to, to take a look at the past and, and to, to rectify that. Um, uh, but yeah, I think this is a question that we, we have to really grapple with. What do, you, what do you do when there, again, there are harmful ideas out there uh, to groups of people. Um, what is our responsibility when it comes to harm. I, I'm not sure we're always quite there yet on the right answer on, on some of these things. Yeah, I would ask, that, you know, the idea of a neutral career with everyone having equal access to platforms to offer their ideas is kind of idealistic and mythical at best, right? Um, we all know from working with op-ed sections that the people who I think their ideas are worthy enough of being published, uh, tend to be male, uh, tend to be white, tend to be older. Um, you know, all of us in our, in, in that, at the legacy publications have had to make a lot of effort to make sure that a younger generation of scholars and thinkers and activists, much more diversity along gender, race, sexual orientation, et cetera, that there's a greater diversity of voices in our pages. That's something we really have to work at. Um, I, you know, I, I, I do want to tackle a couple of the issues head on. I think some of, over the last past couple of years, a couple of prominent op-ed incidents really across different publications have really, you know, foregrounded the notion of are there some ideas that are too extreme or, or unacceptable? Um, I think, yeah, there are. 
Um, I think that's that. I mean, there are some. I mean, I, I don't. You know, we're not going to publish someone who's who's uh, believes in Adolf Hitler's ideas, but I think that's really an extreme that's actually not very helpful in thinking about the day to day. Instead of thinking about are some ideas acceptable or not acceptable, and that is a question, but that's rarely the one that 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 we're in, encountered with. What I think we're more likely to be encountered with are ideas that are provocative, or challenging, or difficult, or controversial. And our job as editors is to help the writer, whether we personally agree or not is not relevant. Our job is to help the writer adduce evidence to make the strongest possible logical and persuasive case. But it ultimately has to be a case that is grounded in logic, persuasion, and evidence. And if we do that, I actually think a lot of ideas that are provocative or difficult can enter the discourse, and yeah, they'll, they'll provoke people or, or or upset people. But we've done our duty as opinion editors because we've at least exposed our readers to the broad range of views that are out there. You know, I, something that I think is 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 interesting as we develop that right is there's always a you know, senses of like what's in the bounds and what's out of the bounds, right? That nobody tries to put together an opinion section that's like a totalitarian perspective and also nothing is a total free for all, right? And I think we traditionally had a media structure in which, you know, the views of non-white people were very sort of decentered. Right and 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 marginal, even when they were occasionally sort of allowed in, uh, and there's been a big amount of progress on that, an incredible amount of emphasis on trying to do diversity that way. At the same time, we've had a change in politics, so that voting behavior and ideology has become much more correlated with educational attainment. Right. It wasn't true in the 1990s that people with college degrees uh, differed systematically in their political opinions from, from people without. Uh, so we've come to have a situation where the question of like, what is the relevant community has, I think, become relevant. Right. And a lot of ideas that are common sense among uh, the social stratum of people who work in journalism are actually quite a bit off center of American politics. And a lot of ideas that are very mainstream in American public opinion seem quite right wing uh, to people who are working in media and working in journalism. And it then becomes a, a dilemma for the people who are sort of the stewards of this, right? Do you proclaim an idea that you have good reason to believe 45% of the public agrees with, but it strikes your team as incredibly outre. And yeah. I don't know, like, I, I never worked at a big newspaper like you guys did. I mean, I got my start at, you know, a small circulation ideological magazine. And we would sit around the table at the American Prospect and like, literally say, exactly. like, no, we're not going to print that. Like, that. <laughs> and, and, you know, and the bounds were actually quite narrow. You know, you couldn't say it's good that people are allowed to buy Japanese cars in the American Prospect. Like it was, it was very narrowly focused and, and deliberately so. Uh, but but I think it's I think the rise of educational polarization has created a sort of harder task for the general public sphere enterprise. Matt, I, com Matt, I completely agree. But I would add it's not just educational polarization. It's regional. There's an urban rural divide. And all of us are associated with cities, right? And right. many, by, by its nature, big publications are associated with big cities. A wide swath of America, we know that one of the biggest predictors of whether you know someone supported Trump or not is whether they come from a rural or less populated area. So there are many, many axes of, of division now that I, that I agree mean that people aren't, we're not reaching necessarily the broad publics that we used to. Now, I don't, I, you, some of that you could say the is the mass media's fault, but there's also many ways in which our society has been stratified and kind of fragmented and diced and sliced in way, demographically in ways that are, are, that are not fully under our control. Although I would just also add though, Sewell, that I think that um, we as journalists tend to look at the world on a binary way of the left, right political spectrum. And that often, you know, I, I, I'm sure this happens in your newsroom as well, but we're often saying to ourselves, do we have a conservative viewpoint? Do we have a, but the world doesn't really, most people don't operate their lives that way. Their views are much more heterodox. They're much more situational and circumstantial than, um, than you know, feeling that ideological pull that we sometimes can get very obsessed with. Oh, Karen, yeah. I'm sorry though, I, I cut you off. But oh, sorry, go, so, so we'll go ahead. 
Uh, I know Karen trying to get in all, but to make, yeah, Karen, uh, Katie, I completely agree with you. I'll just say one thing brief. You know, I find that most often, in, in for example, fierce debates in California over land use and affordable housing, it's not really left right. Um, mm -hmm. It's really about how much do people value kind of density. Uh, which co often comes with affordability, but also comes with growth, right? And helping de and letting developers build um, versus kind of, you know, an emphasis on privacy or California way of life, less density. And, and each side actually claim, says they have very good values. And I think they do, but ultimately those values clash when it comes to the question of how should cities build or how do we try to lower rents? Um, I'll just one also very quick story. You know, I, the, probably the thing I've been, I've been um, most, um, uh, burned for was running a page after the election was called uh, of letters from Californians who letters, supported, right? supported yeah. for, who supported Donald Trump. Now we carefully fact checked, verified, edited the heck out of every letter. There was nothing unreasonable being said. You know, there was no one openly espousing racism. Several of the writers were people of color, but nonetheless, you know, we got an intense blowback from our readers, basically mm -hmm. saying, "How dare you uh, platform legitimize?" Uh, uh, or even show that it's acceptable to have done this. And I was like, geez, 75 million people voted for Trump folks, including 6 million in California. I, I, we may not, I may not disagree with, I may disagree with their voting decision, but I can't pretend they don't exist. Yeah, we did that in 2018, you may recall, um, after Trump's first year and we got some similar feedback. Um, Karen, I, 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 I feel like you wanted to jump in. I'm sorry for cutting you off. Um, no, I mean, I think that, um Look, at the same time, you know, that all of this is happen happening and, and we're we're still we're still in a business. Journalism is still a business and we're in or operating in an attention, uh, you know, an attention economy. And our op-eds are competing not only with each other's pages, but we're competing with that. <laughs> you know, we're competing with um, we're competing with podcasts or competing with people who have viral threads on on Twitter. And so I, I think a lot about this idea that, uh, you know, do we reach into some of these segments and, and fragments of, of uh, these siloed, um, these siloed, you know, places uh, that cater to, again, you know, conspiracy theories and what I would argue is xenophobia based on, I, I think a lot of our, the, the rationale <laughs> might need to change because I, I would hear and we talk a lot about, well, well, we just want to expose our readers to what people are saying and people are thinking out there um, because if they don't get it here, I mean, they're already going somewhere else to be, you know, affirmed, seen and heard. <laughs> I just think that these questions, especially as, as, the field becomes much more crowded, much more segmented. And it's that, that basically that pressure in some ways, maybe it'll be less because Trump is out of office. We tend to blow with the wind sometimes politically, um, but I'd be very curious to, to kind of see how we're going to react to, um, especially as, as more and more individual creators and writers can strike out on their own and develop audiences that way. And we see value in their numbers, um, how we'll grapple with that. Um, I wanna to turn to audience questions, but I think I, I you actually anticipated um, one more question I had for this group, which is how do you think political and more generally opinion discourse is gonna change in the post Trump era? You know, um, what is the biggest thing that you see changing about our jobs and how we do them, you know, over the next three years. Um, I think. I mean, I think already. I, I mean, I feel like we're we're kind of out of the obviously the scramble to to cover whatever Trump has done or said on Twitter. I mean, I think we can't underestimate the um, the difference in atmosphere now that the uh, former president is does not have access to to Twitter. Um, you know, I, I think it's speaking as, as someone who we did build a bit of the infrastructure with global opinions um, during the Trump years. And we did have writers that weren't just writing about politics, but developing their voices on other things. Um, I think 
we're going to see uh, we're going to see whether or not you know businesses or, or, or op-ed pages really made those investments while our traffic numbers were up, while the ratings were up, while you know people were subscribing. How are we converting that into efforts to again? I think getting back into, I would like to see, and I'd hope to see a lot more efforts into, just in general, we should be doing this all the time, but into really developing um, developing writers, but developing audiences. I think there's a lot more understanding of the importance of, frankly, um, understanding digital communities and, and audiences and what those conversations are like and how our journalism fits into that. So more, in some ways, like more of an audience first uh, type of ethos, almost rather than writer first, if that kind of makes sense. Um, I think now, you know, legacy is sort of like, oh gosh, audience editors matter, social media really matters, and then we're catching up um, very well, I hope, I think, to, to now, yeah, what are people interested in that doesn't have to do with traditional left-right politics? Um, yeah. Um, I, as I said in, talk, in, my, in my comments, I think we have to try to empower a whole bunch of people who haven't traditionally thought of themselves as writers. And I think that's actually one of the most healing things we can do for society, people who are incarcerated, people who are in poverty. You know, um, or in, in a way, like ours is a, a very narrative era, right? When, when, peop, when the power of storytelling is, you know, driving everything that we're seeing in media, you know, regardless of the medium, whether it's the podcast boom, newsletters, uh, uh, video, you know, the, the voice and the opinionated voice, I think, are more powerful than ever before. I think a, an organization like the New York Times is the leader in kind of really taking, you know, that idea of a powerful voice, expressing it through so many different kinds of medias other than, than just text, and that's to really be commended. I think that's the wave of the future. Um, I do think that there are there's a lot of left-right things that, that do need sorting out. Um, and it could be I'm saying that because I'm a political junkie, but I think a, a, you know a big part of the future is really what principled conservatism will look like. Um, I'll, I'll get to liberalism in a moment, but I think there's a real um, sense right now that there has the center hasn't held in terms of conservative thought. I personally find that very destabilizing for our democracy. I, I don't know of an advanced democracy that doesn't have a stable center-right party at the core of its politics. I, I don't think that ours is stable right now. I think it's very factionalized. And uh, you know, there's so much uncertainty going into the midterm elections, much less even thinking about four years from now. Um, the Democrats have a different challenge. Uh, the Democrats are trying to bring you know, a big tent back, um, much like the New Deal coalition. That tent too will have a lot of contradictions and fissures and tensions and fractures, particularly around the relative emphasis on class versus race and other aspects of our identity. So you know that that's going to heat up. But I, I will agree with Karen. I think look, I, my view is is pretty clear on this. I thought Trump had a deadening influence on American intellectual and spiritual life, and by that I mean that even when he had interesting ideas, which were it's not infrequent. The way in which he set about uh, uh, uttering them or expressing them uh, didn't really allow for the kind of helpful, for the, for the kind of civic, civil reasoned discourse, talking about principles and about value that we need to actually work through our hardest stuff. Because ultimately, even though our, all of our opinion pages are fact checked and the facts are crucial, they're the foundation, but ultimately what makes opinion so interesting is when there are competing or, or clashing values. And then we're trying to talk, you know, have a discussion as a society about which values we would share, we wish to give greater priority to. You know, I think one of the big things that, that opinion journalists do and opinion sections do is they help people organize the landscape of political debate to understand which issues go with which. Uh, Sewell was talking about housing debates in coastal cities, where some of what people contest is, well, what should the land use policy be? But some of what they contest is like, how should we think about this? Right. Is it uh, is it right wing because you're saying, well, there should be less regulation or are you saying this is progressive? We're embracing change. We're embracing urbanism. We're embracing diversity. Right. And they're just it, you could do it either way. Like you can make the argument either way. But something that columnists do and that opinion sections do is sort of 
paint the landscape in particular ways for people. Trump was the least, you know, ideasy, I think, major political leader that we've had, but he scrambled the, the chessboard a lot. He's provoked a significant realignment among the mass population, caused people to question, you know, is free trade really something that goes with low taxes, right? How, how do we want to think about these kinds of things? And there's an effort, I mean, on the right, I think in particular, to try to sort of backfill that. Like, can we make up a Trumpism that makes sense, that appeals to the same voters, but like works as policy and legislation? And that's really interesting to watch. And then there's an effort by progressives to sort of incorporate a wider range of viewpoints, to incorporate diversity in a real way, but then to say, well, what does that mean as a governing agenda, as opposed to just a sort of um, set of ticks or, or rhetorical mode? And, you know, Joe Biden is like, he's really old, right? It's, it's almost like a, like a placeholder figure where a great way for Democrats to agree to disagree is to be like, all right, we're going to bring back the vice president from the last administration um, and, and try to work out what happens next. But that's what I think we're doing in opinion spaces is trying to organize what's going to be the next big debates in American politics. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so let's turn to some questions from the audience. Karen, the, the first one here is for you from Cesar, who asks, in each country, do you look for only one person who gives an opinion on all issues or more than one columnist who does so on many different issues? That's a great question. I mean, I think in, in general, um, always want to avoid the <laughs> one person to speak for all people of all, you know, want to avoid tokenization, basically, right? Um, but I think it, 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 it speaks to what, um, you know, Sewell and, and Maddie and, and what we've, we've all said is that, uh, you know, you're, you're looking for people who consistently and, and professionally are able to express themselves um, in a way that um, has granted them um, an audience. I mean, I think I think for my work with with global opinions, you know, it, it did start off just part of it is just an infrastructure issue on our end. I mean, there's only so many. It, it takes. A, I think people underestimate how much time it can take to really um, be able to develop um, a relationship, develop a beat, develop expertise, to uh, work with someone to to help them find their voice. Um, it, it can take years, honestly. Uh, so I, I and the team, we really took time to really invest in, um, say, you know, Barca Dutt of, of India, who I've been working with for almost four years, four years now. And of course, uh, we have, she has her, you know, viewpoints. Um, she, uh, and we, we often have people who will write in and say, hey, I'm from India. I disagree with what Barca has said. And we run those too. So you know, it's not it's not that we're uh, you know looking for one <laughs> representative who can speak for for the whole country. Um, but often it is from places where we just often don't have at all anyone from that place or that region who can speak to from a very uh, uh, ground level um, how they see how they see things. So again, right now, I mean, looking at COVID and, and, and India, um, there are, there's room for so many uh, viewpoints on how India got to got to this place. So we just do as, as much as we can. We also have Rana Ayub, um, who also writes for us as well um, from India, but we are always, we are open. <laughs> our, our inboxes are open for, for people and, and for pitches. So I think we're always like scouting for uh, for who could work, but again, it it is about people who who, um, and I agree with Sewell that we also not everyone is a writer, but they have a story to share, they have a narrative to share. Uh, so you know there are those who are consistently, you know, great with writers, and they meet our needs for for deadlines and and for all of that. But um, but we we do our best to try to. Uh, find as as many people uh, as we as we can. Um, thank you. Uh, the next one is from Matt. It's from Margaret. Um, 
She says, you note that your work is now unbundled, but your work is hosted on and you are paid by a platform, Substack. The sum are leaving because they allege it is benefiting from and encouraging a culture of anti-trans bigotry. Can, can you speak to that? Yeah, uh, I mean, for starters, I, I, I'm not paid by Substack. Substack is a payment processing method. Um, you know, so I, I, I think that this larger question of, you know, do people want to associate other writers with the platforms that they jointly use is something that, you know, uh, it requires a little bit of harder thought, right? Uh, because we are all using a lot of the shared elements of the internet infrastructure to communicate with our audiences, right? Whether that's Amazon Web Services or Stripe to process payments, it's Verizon and Comcast to deliver the, the broadband out there. Uh, no institution is like genuinely an island. Uh, from the kind of underlying set of plumbing. I think that normally the idea, right, when, when the LA Times or the Washington Post or the New York Times comes out there, they are trying to create a cohesive editorial brand. And so it's completely fair to look at the pieces of content there and say, okay, this influences my assessment of the brand, right? And the brand can be more or less expansive. It can define itself in various ways, but that's what the, what the brand is doing deliberately, right? And it is trying to create a bundle that is more than the sum of its parts, right? The, the New York Times is not just a collection of writers and the particular editors that they work with. It's, it's a thing. Right. It's not totally it's too big to be like the brainchild of any one person, but it is a, a team. And that's the idea of the product. I don't think that Substack is like that. I wouldn't suggest that anybody browse Substack. It's like a lot of people out there up and, and writing and doing whatever. Um, but I do think that there is a specific movement to try to say, activist movement to try to say that certain viewpoints are really, really bad. And we want to marginalize the people who have that viewpoint by any means necessary. And that means sort of trying to hound every conceivable platform into kicking them off. I just don't think that that works. I mean, I, I don't think it works as politics. Um, I think that you are going to end up sort of... Um, pushing the audience into weird directions if you try to impose those kinds of restrictions on people. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's basically what I think about it. I mean, it's fine if writers want to go someplace else. Like Substack is not the be all and end all of authoring tools. Uh, I, I might be someplace else in the future. Um, so, you know, good for everybody there. But I, I don't think it makes sense to say that you know, we can't share tools with people whose views we think are really bad. Thank you. Um, we have so many questions in so little time. Um, so um, does opinion journalism include more original reporting than it once did in your experience? This is from Sarah. Uh, what are the pros and cons for this? Do you think this makes it harder for readers to tell the difference between news and opinion? Um, I'll speak for myself for just a moment, um, which is we absolutely do have as much, uh, probably more reporting in some of our opinion pieces. One of the major parts that I always tell people, though, is that's perhaps because we're being more transparent about our reporting. Um, there was always reporting in opinion pieces. In fact, the best reported commentary has had reporting at the heart of it. Think of someone like Nick Kristoff, who works with me still today, um, you know, that is why he is a multi-Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, um, is, is largely to do with his reporting. But I do think we owe our readers more transparency about where we're getting our um, facts from, where we're getting our opinions from, how we're coming up with opinions. And I think that's particularly true for editorials, which when I arrived at the Times, um, very, very rarely quoted people in them. Um, and I think that's because we have to gain trust with readers at every turn. And so um, that is something that we emphasize, actually, is showing our work and trying to be more transparent. It also goes back to some of the things I talked about in my presentation about labeling and making sure that differentiation between news and opinion was crystal clear. But um, we have just one minute if um, others want to jump in. No? OK. <laughs> um, well, then let's take one last question. Um, uh, this is, uh, you know, we've touched upon this a little bit. 
Um, there are kind of two questions here. Uh, one is from Nancy, which is how many op-ed uh, submissions do you vet daily? Um, again, as Mallory mentioned, we at the New York Times the Express op-ed anymore, and we have a new submissions process. And then the other is um, how do you deal with opinions that are based on misinformation or disinformation and only serve to spread it? That is from Harriet. Um, I'll take the second one. That's easy. Okay. Um, we don't run it. <laughs> yeah. It's very, Same here. yeah, if it's very um, although, you know, I think I think to a certain extent, um, and, and to answer the first question, um, we actually had a meeting about this, so please don't misquote me. So we have a we probably see as a section uh, and then it's different from from every individual editor because I you know I'm writing more, I still get probably 10 to 20 pitches um, a day. Uh, so let's just say ballpark uh, from what kind of can come across my desk, um, possibly as a pool. I'm probably, I could probably have access to about like 60 or 70 just pitches a day or so. Like four. And then meaning if we only can choose maybe one to maybe run as a guest on it to one run that week. Um, I think it calculates out basically when everything calculates out is basically we have like a 2% acceptance rate of, of outside um, op-eds or so. Um, so it's the, it's very, it's, it's very tough. Um, and so that's part of, that's also part of the reason why we have such, um, we do have to have, curatorial standards because so much is is coming across uh coming across our our desks so I, I say that in defense of our the editor tribe also if we don't always have a chance to get to get back um we are you know we're flooded uh with with pitches um and with drafts so it's uh, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, being flooded with pitches and drafts and opinions is the place to end on. Um, <laughs> I'm getting the signal to wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Karen and Sewell and Matt. I really appreciate us, you joining us today and I'll hand things back over to Mallory. Wow, thank you so, so much. This was a fascinating panel with such incredible insights. I know I personally learned a lot from it um, and I particularly liked what you were saying about how opinion news is changing and how it's elevating a diversity of voices and how it can really create meaningful awareness and change, particularly at this moment in time. So thank you so much. Um, I'm sure this will be a great ongoing resource uh, for journalists and students and journalism educators. So for those of you who want to access it after the fact um, and share it on social media, you'll be able to find a recording of this session in English and in Spanish on our ISOJ YouTube page. Um, so thank you again. Uh, we have a break now before our next session, and we hope you'll take this time to unwind and join us and other eyesagers and speakers in our Wonder Room, um, where you can really network and just chat with other people who are attending this year's conference. So we'll post a link to that Wonder Room in the chat. And I also want to mention that we have a pick and post page on our website, isoj.org. And on this page, which we'll link to in the chat, you can download really fun ISOJ graphics and post them on social media with our ISOJ 2021 hashtag. So we hope you'll keep the conversation going on social media and in the Wonder Room, and that you'll join us back here at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time for our next panel titled Cracking the Code for Local News Through Networking and Collaboration. So this is going to be a really strong panel made up of six journalists, and it will be led by Karen Runlet of the Knight Foundation. So you won't want to miss it. We'll see you then.